Well, today we are going to be reading again from the second chapter of Acts. We're going to be reading verses 5 and following. So listen for a fresh new word from God today. Now, there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they ask, Are not all these speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own language, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. I think I'm going to stay here behind the pulpit today with the communion uh, table in front of the, uh, of the altar area a little bit. It's a little unusual for me. I like to move around, but I'm going to try to be still today for a bit. Uh, we've been in a worship series on the Holy Spirit. Uh, thus, the all the songs and singing about the Holy Spirit and inviting the Holy Spirit into this place. Uh, it's a four-week series. At the beginning, we talked about that word suddenly that comes uh, in this first chapter of the second chapter of uh, the second chapter of Acts, the first part of that second chapter. Then we talked how they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and about the power and purpose of that. And today, we're going to talk about that question that arose among the crowd: What? does this all mean? And so one of the amazing truths about the biblical witness as it is compared with other uh, writings almost throughout all of history is its honesty. In other words, history usually just writes the good parts about those who end up in power, right? And we don't really hear much of anything else. We don't hear any of the bad things about them and we don't hear a lot of good things about other people who never get recorded. But in the story of the faith of God's people, we get the good and the bad. And in this particular case, uh, this amazing story about the birth of the church unfolds, and there is this uh, witness to the fact that there was perplexity and amazement among the people. They didn't necessarily understand what was going on. And there's this penetrating question that comes in the midst of this story about the beginning of the church that says, what does this all mean? So they've heard this mighty wind. They've seen the flames come onto the shoulders of the disciples. They've heard them speaking in their own native language and being heard in the, the native language of the hearer. And all of that was pretty amazing. And when it said that they came because they heard something, the way this part of that scripture really talks, they heard them actually speaking one language and people hearing it in another. And that's what caused them to come and try to listen to what was going on. And, and, and so I'm reminded that that's not necessarily an unusual question in scripture for, for people to admit they don't get it, they don't understand, and what does this mean, how does this happen? Y'all recall that story of Jesus when he was out on the boat and the waves came and began to pound the boat and they thought they would all perish because they would sink and he calmed the storm and his own disciples, his closest uh, friends, were in the boat with him and they said that, uh, you know, they were, they were just as you know, perplexed as these people that hear this other talk and it says, who then is this that he commands even the wind and the water to be still and it happens? You see, there's things about this way that this God works that we worship 
that is not necessarily too easy to understand or to grasp really what's going on. And I think it's a perfectly legitimate question for us to ask, so what does this all mean? What does it mean to me? What does it mean to you? What does the whole situation mean? Who is this guy that can calm wind and, and still the waters so that we might be saved? What sometimes I think is the problem is that we offer up answers and we seek uh, sometimes the wrong answer to answer the question of what does this all mean? And I think to a certain degree that's what happens in this story. The, pas the passage states that everybody, all of them were talking and this, this murmuring, the question that kept coming out is what does this all mean? But then it says, uh, you know, that some of the others said, oh, they're just filled with new wine. They're just a little drunk. That's what the whole answer to this question is. And I think that the nature of this whole human drama is that there are certain people who are never going to get it, whatever it is. I mean, whatever's going on, there's going to be some people who just don't get it. Now, in this case, it probably was the majority of them, but in the midst of events that we don't understand, we, are, uh, we really, a lot of times, pass them off as something that is unnatural, or we give answers to the questions that really aren't right answers, but we accept them because we understand them. And that's what happens with this group. They say, oh, they're just a little drunk. And it's interesting to me for a couple of reasons. One is, you know, just think about it. There obviously was that behavior going on then, not so different than today, that sometimes we run into people and we say, well, yeah, they're just a little drunk. We can recognize that, right? And these people had seen that behavior and they recognized it. And they just said, that's the answer. But if they gave that answer that was way too simple of an explanation for what really was going on, and the truth is, it wasn't the correct answer at all. So today is All Saints Day. And in honor that we remember and we honor those who we have loved and who have gone on uh, to be with the Lord and that those who have gone on and... and uh, now reside in the church eternal, there, there is this understanding that has been part of the historic understanding of the church is that we do not necessarily understand everything there is to do about life and death. And in fact, the funeral or liturgy that the United Methodist Church uses, and you have all, I'm sure, heard these words if you've been to United Methodist funerals, acknowledge the fact that sometimes we're not going to understand. And there is a mystery to this. Early in the service, you hear these words. Give to us now your grace that as we shrink before the mystery of death, we may see the light of eternity. You see, it gives them an answer that even though there is a mystery, there is something in the future that we can look forward to, which is the light of eternity. And then later, typically, at the graveside, the pastor would pray this prayer for those who are there who are mourning the loss of a loved one. And they are praying this prayer to those who sorrow. And it says this, Amidst things they cannot understand, help them to trust in your care. You see, there's going to be some things you don't understand, but the one thing that you can do and you can be assured of is that you can trust in God's care. So our own funeral liturgy lays out that same kind of a thought process, that even though there are going to be some things we can't answer, there is always the truth that we can trust in when God is moving, God will be the one in control and will take care of it. Now, Acts 2 is a powerful example of how God seeks to work amid the ordinary, everyday experience of life. God evidently moves among us. That's part of the evidence of this day. And with us and through us and all around us. And such work that God does in some people, it makes some people uneasy. There were some people in that crowd who were not comfortable with what was going on. And they were saying, what does this mean? And, and some were explaining it by, you know, taking the easy route at. And, and rather than recognizing the mystery of life, 
that God sometimes works and God sometimes does things that we can't understand, they were seeking to, um, to not to necessarily learn and to really answer the question, what does it mean? But it's, it, they, were, they were leading to try to answer an unnatural thing with a natural answer. Do you all understand how that works? Do you see that happening someday? And I think there's two problems with this kind of a scenario that wraps up in this story. One is that we take as a church, we take a stance that people should never even ask the question, what does it mean? We should simply believe it and never question it, right? But I got to tell you, that's not my human experience. I have a book on my shelf that's called The Sacredness of Questioning Everything. And the, the reason that I, uh, read, I have read that book and reuse it sometimes as a, as a reference is this, that once we have answered that question and we know that we have worked through the question and absolutely come to an, a, an understanding that we feel absolutely sure that God has given us that answer, when that question comes again, whether it's from something that happens to you or whether it has something that happens to your church or whether it's something that happens to your community, you can stand sure and say, I have something we can stand on. Now, in the funeral liturgy, it says you can understand and stand on the fact that you can trust in God's care. And in this particular passage, what Peter does, we'll look at in just a second, is say, I've got a good, perfectly good explanation for this. And he does that. So the very message that God sought to bring us to, uh, uh, to them that morning and to us is that uh, there, there is a, an appropriate explanation for a lot of what God does. And although it may be mysterious and not easy to answer, there is an answer. And the community of faith Sometimes we get so wrapped up in the sense that what God is doing for us that we um, have another issue that pops up. And that is that, that we aren't real kind to those who are in that question saying, well, maybe they're just drunk. You see, we're not real kind to those who just don't quite get it yet. And we want to, to, we, we want to push them even further into it, necessarily into a hole sometimes. When, when they're questioning and they're trying to figure it out and they just don't get it yet, I will tell you that the rest of this whole story that I didn't read, the very next verses, Peter begins to have an explanation. And he preaches a sermon that, friends, I've read, and I'll bet, I've, I told you all before, I'll bet if I stood in this pulpit and read it with the, the perfect inflections and the perfect emotion that Peter had that day, the same thing wouldn't happen because y'all remember what happened? Over a thousand people got up and got baptized and joined the church. I'm just guessing that's not going to happen to me. Because you see, there's a difference between that. God was using that day and that explanation and that purpose and that sermon to do a specific work in the world. And the truth is, that we remember that this proclamation that we just read about again, where somebody is speaking in the, the language of the Galileans and the Medes and the, uh, everybody else from around there, all, all the countries around, even Rome, that were speaking a, a totally different language, could hear it and hear it and understand it. And the truth is the community of faith needs to take more responsibility for those who listen to things like this and don't get it. I think we need to open up our hearts and open our minds and be able to do what Peter does in this explanation. And, the lesson, and what he does is he takes responsibility for the others that, he, um, that have not quite gotten it yet. And he takes those folks and explains it, hopefully in a way that they would understand. And so that those who were questioning the fact that this was just a, a group that had had a little too much to drink already, was explained to them, and guess what? The Holy Spirit worked through that, and a bunch of them got saved that day and joined the church. You see, this mystery of how God works is, is an interesting and wonderful thing. So 
John Wesley, our founder of the United Methodist Church, or the, the Methodist movement, actually, if you ever want to, you, you can find that he has a, notes on almost every individual scripture in the Bible. And I, I looked at his notes on these, this little passage, and here's what I found from those notes. That John Wesley claims that Peter gave a simple and polite answer to the comment that was coming from the crowd. Did y'all hear that? Simple, meaning it didn't take any big, deep theological understanding, right? And it was polite. He didn't call them names. He didn't point at them and say, you are others. And, and, and by the way, we're in the scripture in this particular passage where it says, and others said, could easily be translated, those others. Have you ever heard those term, that term used before? Those others? <laughs> you know what those others look like? They don't look like you and me. They don't dress like you and me. They don't act like you and me. And that's what we call them, right? Well, those other people. <laughs> they do that stuff, right? So Peter was giving an explanation to those others in a simple and polite manner. And he does this. What he says about the first words that Peter says is, and what Peter says is that, or he gets up and he addresses them, and what John Wesley says about that is that all of the gestures, all of the words of Peter show the utmost sobriety. Do you see what Peter's doing? He just said, oh, y'all are a bunch of drunks. And he gets up, and what does he do? He acts like somebody who's perfectly sober. Doesn't say a word. Doesn't say, I'm not drunk. Doesn't call them out. He just simply stands up and is sober. <laughs> That's an interesting way to do something, isn't it? And then he says this, that the people that are gathered, evidently, in this way it's written in Scripture, are Jews. And he simply says this, that it's early in the day. And here's what they would have heard. This was the day of Pentecost. You know what Jews do on high holy days? They don't eat or drink anything until noon. And what Peter says is, it's nine o'clock. We're following Pentecost. We hadn't had a thing to eat or drink. And then he goes on, Peter does, in the very next sentence, it says, here's a really good explanation of how we're acting. Go back in your very own scripture and look at Joel 28, and there you will find a story about people who have uh, gotten the power of the Holy Spirit to speak to the people of Israel so that they might come to a full understanding of who Jesus is and who they are. So do you see what he does? He simply acts according to his own calling and faith. He reminds them that just like they who were there, if they were celebrating Pentecost, they hadn't had anything. And here's a good explanation. And he gave them a very simple explanation that said, this is the story of Joel. So, friends, what does this all mean? Is that a question you ask yourself sometimes? What does this Christian faith, what does it mean? What does it mean to, to live a Christian life? Well, I will tell you that is a question for me that is extremely relevant. And it's a relevant question that the church must wrestle with for those who dare to ask it. Those who are brave enough to say, what does this mean? If the God experiences of life cannot hold up to honest questions posed by those who dare to ask them, then the church, I will tell you, has failed to understand the very nature of what God is and who God is. Because God is doing and God is acting and the Holy Spirit works exactly the way that Scripture tells us that is going to happen. God seeks to do it. 
we might not understand it, but if we come down to the belief that we can stand behind what we hear from what Scripture has told us and say, in all of this, God cares. In all of this, whatever has happened in, to you or to your church or to your friends, that when we are confronted with a mystery and, the, and, and something that, that we don't understand, it might just be the power of God who continues to mur- move and work among us. And we, as the church, need to claim that power and that purpose that we talked about last week of being right in the right place at the right time to hear exactly what God has to say for us. Amen.